So, you know, this is the watershed trial that basically demonstrated that we can do phase three uh, randomized control studies in rare diseases as long as we have sort of a international group that's behind it. And this was a study that was basically done in the U.S. and Canada comparing sorafenib to placebo that was presented at ASCO and then subsequently published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2018. And what we saw here was that sorafenib improved sort of the the primary endpoint was progression-free survival. And the median progression-free survival in the placebo arm was 11.3 months, while on sorafenib, it had not been reached. And this gave a hazard ratio, an astounding hazard ratio of 0.13. Uh, which was uh, highly uh, significant. So clearly the drug uh, was very active in this disease and basically has put this as one of the uh, gold standard drugs um, in this disease globally. But as we all know that the tolerability of serafinib can be quite challenging, especially when you're taking this on a daily basis And even with dose reductions, sometimes this drug is uh, somewhat challenging to take in the vast majority of patients. So there was a a, a real need to try to come up with drugs that had, uh, you know, uh, that were one fundamentally had a better tolerability profile. And so around the same time, we were also sort of starting to work with this gamma secretase enzyme. And, um, and, um, And that, at least in the early phase one, phase two, it appeared that had a better tolerability profile than some of the TKIs that we've been working with. And that was essentially the the impetus to start working in that space. And sort of in the heels of this phase three study, there was also a randomized phase two study from the French sarcoma group looking at pazopinib. So pazopinib, you know, is a drug that is approved in sarcomas in the second line setting. And that was based on a phase three data, including all, all sarcomas. But in this particular phase two study, you know, patients with desmoid tumors were randomized to pazopinib versus IV methotrexate and vinblastin. And um, again, this was randomized in a two is to one fashion. And people actually received uh, the highest dose of pazopinib, which is 800 milligrams uh, for a maximum of one year, while patients on the, on the other arm, the comparator arm, received methotrexate and vinblastine uh, all, every two weeks for six months up to a maximum of one year. And again, what we see with that study uh, was that the, um, about 89 patients were enrolled in over almost a five-month period in France. And again, what we see there is that pazopinib had a very nice uh, activity with a six-month uh, non-progression rate of 81%, while uh, methotrexate vinblastine had a six-month non-progression rate of 45%. So again, the purpose of the study was not to compare the two arms. Uh, so this is, this is basically a randomized phase two. But the bottom line is that pazopinib seemed to have similar activity, similar side effect profile as that of sorafenib. So in terms of other, you know, randomized uh, Phase three studies, uh, the DeFi study or the or the nirogasistat uh, in progressing desmoid tumor patients. This was uh, a plenary presentation at ESMO. This was presented by my colleague uh, Bernd Casper um, from Germany, and um, you know this is um, you know the gamma secretase enzymes are are found ubiquitously throughout all cells, and they have unique mechanism of actions. It's not a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And in this context, we think that the, the mechanistic rationale is probably through the WINT or the NOTCH signaling pathway, um, although that remains to be sort of uh, further understood and defined. But these tumors, um, so in the DEFI study, this was a, also a, this was truly a global study uh, where 37 sites uh, participated in both North America as well as Europe. 142 patients were um, enrolled, and all of these patients had to have progressive disease at the time of entry. So this had 20% 
tumor growth by resist within the last 12 months in order to enter enter into the study. And it didn't matter whether you were treatment naive or, or had refractory disease. So when patients with progressive disease entered, they were randomized uh, to nirogasistat at 150 milligrams twice daily or placebo. Um, and uh, patients were watched with scans every um, every three months. And at the time of progression, if this was truly a resist progression, people were unblinded. And if you happen to be on placebo arm, you, you could uh, cross over into open label narrow gas stat. And the primary endpoint was uh, progression-free survival. The secondary endpoint was response rates and also patient-reported outcomes, including symptom, uh, physical role and function, and overall quality of life. Uh, the baseline demographics, uh, this again is, you know, most of the patients were in their 30s. Um, and the median age was 33 on nirogasistat and 34 in placebo. There was a slight female preponderance to this. So about 60% of patients were women. Um, and not surprisingly, the vast majority of patients had mutations in beta catenin, about 85% of patients. And, um, and in terms of treatment naive, uh, about 25% of patients are treatment naive, and the vast majority, about 74%, had sort of refractory disease or had recurrence of their disease. And in terms of um, prior systemic therapy, 61% of patients had prior systemic therapies. And as a whole, uh, patients who entered the study had two prior lines of uh, therapy uh, at the time of entry. Yes, Neil. I was going to ask you before, uh, you know, does the, the typical, you know, NGS assay that docs are doing, will that pick up beta catenin uh, uh, mutations? Yes, it's it certainly would uh, pick up the beta catenin mutation. Um, although it's, you know, I mean, these panels are usually, you know, 300, 400, 500 gene panels. It may be a bit of an, it may be a bit of an excessive way to pick up these mutations, but they very nicely pick up these beta catenin as well as these APC mutations. The better thing is if you are already suspecting a desmoid tumor, if feasible, even like an RT-PCR just for beta catenin and APC uh, would be much more cost-effective way of determining this. And the benefit here is that if you, it's twofold. One is if you know that the patient's tumor has beta catenin mutation, then you don't have to get a, a colonoscopy. Because if you didn't know that, then you have to assume that maybe this is APC related, maybe they have FAP, and this usually triggers uh, a referral to gastroenterology uh, to make sure that they don't have FAP. Uh, uh, but if you know for a fact that they have beta catenin mutation, then, then, then with good confidence, you can say that they don't have FAP. Do you send some type of a germline testing on them? If you detect an APC mutation, you absolutely need to sort of get them formally referred to genetic counseling and then a germline testing and cascade testing and things subsequently to that, yes. Do people who don't have beta catenin uh, mutations respond? And is there any correlation between the level of beta catenin and response? Yeah, we've never looked at levels of beta catenin uh, and response. Um, that that's an unanswered question, but in this DeFi study with Nirogasistat, it didn't matter whether you had a beta catenin mutation or an APC mutation. Patients responded regardless, uh, regardless of that. And about twenty two percent of the whole study had patients with APC, which is a really high number, which is a which is a good number of patients. So we can say with with some you know with good confidence that these patients do res did respond very well to the drug. But essentially, all these patients have beta catenin mutations or ATC, one or the other? That's correct. They either have one or the other. In some rare cases, we still have something called wild type, which is neither beta catenin nor APC. But, I, but those are truly, truly rare. And uh, we think that ultimately, whatever mutation they have, it probably still sort of ends up activating the wind signaling pathway. Uh, but for the vast majority, for the time being, we can say... Most of them are beta catenin, a subset minority are APC. So it's a very much Please a continue. binary sort of a system, yeah. 
Hmm. So in this DeFi uh, phase three study, uh, as it was presented at the ESMO plenary session, um, this uh, showed that there was a, um, it met its primary endpoint of progression-free survival. Um, narrow, you know, the placebo uh, had a median PFS of 15 months um, with a confidence interval of 8.4 months to, uh, to not evaluable. Meanwhile, narrow gasostat uh, was, you know, at the time the study uh, closed or was evaluated, um, had still not reached, um, you know, the, it still had not met enough events in its arm. Uh, so the difference in hazard ratio was again, really astounding. Uh, hazard ratio of 0 0.29 uh, with a p-value of less than 0 0.001. So that was uh, highly encouraging, as you can see with the separation of the curves. And uh, in all the other subgroups, you know, pre-specified subgroups, whether it was gender, type of mutation, location of the disease, whether it was single or multifocal, whether someone had prior surgery or chemotherapy, or tyrosine kinase inhibitors, these drugs seem to work um, uh, in all these uh, situations. So that was, once again, very um, encouraging as well. In terms of the objective response rate, um, the uh, narragasistat had a 41% uh, response rate. Meanwhile, the placebo had an 8% response rate. And again, this is something that we have just come to accept with these disease, with this disease, that there is going to be spontaneous regressions in a subset of patients. And in the in the therapeutic arm with the investigational drug, seven percent of patients had a complete response, while thirty four percent of patients had a partial response. And in the placebo arm, uh, there was no patient who had a complete response. Um, in terms of progressive disease, about 14% of patients on placebo had frank resist progression. Uh, some other patients came off study for clinical progression. And in nirogastostat, only 1% of patient, only one patient had a progressive uh, disease. And, the, and interestingly, the time to response was much faster with nirogastostat compared to these few uh, responses in the placebo arm. In nirogastostat, the time to response the median time to response was about 5.6 months, while in the placebo arm was 11 months. So we here we see the substantial reductions in tumor size uh, with nirogastostat versus uh, placebo. And next, uh, you know, very I think this is as you mentioned before, truly one of the most interesting parts of this study was the incorporation of patient-reported outcomes. And in this, the instrument that was used is a instrument that is well commonly used across oncology trials has been used for many decades now. This is known as a brief pain inventory. And as you can see here, the patients who are on placebo, their, their pain either worsened or did not improve at all. Meanwhile, patients on the treatment narragasistat had a significant improvement in their, in their pain uh, uh, threshold. But beyond pain, uh, we also looked at uh, their overall desmoid tumor-specific symptoms, uh, looking at a whole host of different symptoms and putting it together as a severity score. And what's very interesting is that there is this new tool or this new instrument that was specifically designed just for desmoid tumors. And this went through a very rigorous development process and validation process. And again, this was spearheaded. A lot of the work came from Memorial Sloan Kettering as well as uh, the Desmoid Tumor Research Foundation, where we developed this brand new tool. And what's important is that there's not that many disease-specific patient-reported outcomes that are validated as, as endpoints in, in oncology. There's just really a handful of these available. So it's pretty remarkable that for a rare disease, we now have a, a dedicated patient-reported outcome where we can measure how the drug makes you feel. And again, what we see here is that the desmoid tumor-related symptom severity actually worsens for patients on placebo, while it significantly improves on patients uh, who are on nirogasistat. And we see this again in terms of their functioning as well as quality of life improvements as well. So beyond improvement in progression-free survival and response rates, we're also seeing that patients are feeling better. And, and, and that's a very important endpoint. 
uh, here. And then shifting into the very important aspect of uh, of narrow gas is that safety profile. Um, you know, the the duration of study exposure was about 20.6 months on narrow gas stat and 11.4 months on the, on placebo. And the the most common side effects were diarrhea, nausea, fatigue, um, and um, and also uh, skin rash. Uh, this is usually a maculopapular or a hit or what we suspect is a herdadenitis supportiva, um, as well as some stomatitis. Interesting in the blood work, uh, one of the things that we can see is hypophosphatemia. And this is uh, likely, the exact mechanism is not known, whether this is a direct impact from kidney or whether this is related to patients having diarrhea and losing phosphate uh, through the GI tract is not entirely clear. Um, but grade three toxicities were really low. I mean, diarrhea grade three was seen in about 16% of patients. Many of these got better with dose reduction or holding of the drug. And rest of the other, any grade three events with nausea or fatigue or hypophosphatemia was less than 5% uh, of, of patients. So, the, so overall, the drug is very well tolerated. And I think uh, when, when dose reduced or, or if the dose is held, we can certainly uh, you know, take care of patients for a long period of time while simultaneously giving them a good quality of life as well. One one unusual or unexpected side effects was ovarian dysfunction seen in women of childbearing potential. Um, I think possibly this signal was missed previously because these drugs were evaluated in uh, older patients with uh, with a whole host of other solid tumors. Um, so I think this signal was probably missed, but now that this study was primarily done in younger patients, as I mentioned before, the vast majority of these patients were in their 30s. Uh, so, you know, these women uh, reported early on uh, about changes in their menstrual uh, cycle. Uh, and um, so further evaluation found that there was a... Uh, significant reduction in the female reproductive hormone levels, as well as uh, amenorrhea uh, and other changes that were noted. But what's important here is that 36 patients were noted to be sort of childbearing potential. Of those, 75% of them had some ovarian dysfunction. Um, so about 40% of that group, so about 11 patients, when they found out about this, they discontinued from narogastostat uh, either for this reason or for any other reason. And in those patients, almost all of them, 100% of those patients, all recovered their ovarian dysfunction. So it appears that if you stop the drug, um, most of these sim uh, symptoms and these issues of ovarian dysfunction is reversible. And in remaining about 52% of patients who continue to stay on the study, uh, some of them had uh, you know, resolution of these issues even while they were on the drug. Um, so it seems like, you know, that that there is a, uh, even when you're on the study or on the study drug, that's, that there is a sort of a resolution of this that happens. And then about 36% of patients, uh, their symptoms remain unresolved for ovarian dysfunction, but uh, they also happen to continue on the drug at the time of this data lock. So I would say that in summary, the study that was presented at ESMO uh, as a plenary uh, is the largest randomized study that is conducted in this very rare disease, uh, desmoid tumors. Um, and what this basically showed that it showed rapid, sustained, and statistically significant improvements in all the primary as well as the secondary efficacy endpoints. Uh, as previously mentioned, 71% reduction in the risk of disease uh, progression compared to placebo, objective response rate of 41%, uh, including 7% complete response rate with narogastostat, and a significant improvement in pain, uh, symptom burden, and physical role and functioning and overall quality of life. And the safety profile is also very well, uh, overall very well manageable with this drug. And then sort of shifting gears, but sort of still staying with the same class of agents uh, is a 
uh, another gamma secretase inhibitor uh, called AL102. This is a phase two, phase three study that is currently uh, open and available uh, uh, globally. Um, and the phase two portion of the study was presented uh, by Robin Jones from Royal Marsden at, at ESMO as well. And again, what we see here is that the mechanism of action is uh, identical to that of uh, the narrow gas stat uh, study. And the main objective of this study is really looking at uh, the various different schedules and doses to see which should be the winner in order to seamlessly move into a phase three study. Is that graphic in the lower right, they, when they, she presented that they didn't uh, talk about it, but it's like, what does that mean? The scissors and the thing there. Ah, oh, sure, yeah. So what you're seeing there, first and foremost, you're looking at the uh, at the extracellular membrane, and the purple is the notch receptor. So on one side you see notch one through four. So notch has four different receptors: notch one, two, three, four. When a ligand binds to notch, it activates notch, and when there is a ligand that binds to the receptor, what ends up happening is this gamma secretase, which is represented here as a scissor, cleaves it. And when it cleaves it, the other end, which is here known as NICD, stands for notch intracellular domain. So that gets activated, and that's the one that goes into the nucleus and does the rest of the part. So what this AL102 or even narogasistat does is that it basically inhibits that cleavage. So even though you have a ligand uh, signaling the cell to behave in a certain way, that signal is going nowhere because the you know the you know that cleavage part itself is inhibited. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it's great. No, no I like those kind of graphics better than the ones that have fifteen different things on them that I can't understand. That makes sense to me. Anyhow, please continue. Yeah. Um, yeah, so as I was mentioning, this was so this ongoing study, which is known as Ringside, uh, is a phase two, phase three seamless trial of this compound AL102 for treatment of desmoid tumors. And in the phase two portion, it was really figuring out well, what's the right dose and what's the best schedule to, to pick as a winner to move into the phase three randomized study. And uh, what we saw here is basically, in terms of the demographics and baseline, again, about 42 patients entered into the study with various stages of their disease, some previously treated, some treatment naive, um, who were basically randomized to one of these three arms. In one arm, patients got the drug every day. In another two arms, patients got two different types of drugs, but they were both given uh, two days in a week. Uh, with, with subsequently holding the uh, drug on those five days in a week. And again, in terms of the safety profile, this is very consistent with what we're seeing with may of the other gamma secretase enzyme, you know, inhibitors, not just narogacetate, but also many of the drugs that we've previously evaluated over the course of the last uh, 15 years or so. Again, the main issues are gastrointestinal, you know, diarrhea, nausea, stomatitis, dry mouth, and uh, skin. Um, and again, this could be some uh, dry skin, pruritus, and again, this herdnitis suppurativa is something that we've uh, seen as well. And from a metabolic uh, derangement, usually it's hypophosphatemia, and um, that, again, the mechanism is not clear whether it's directly a renal issue or whether it is a GI loss of, of phosphate. But overall, you see that the drug is well tolerated. Uh, maybe slightly more side effects when you get the drug every single day, uh, but uh, with appropriate dose reductions, uh, the side effects are well managed. And so this is phase two, and and this is pretty early results. So what you're looking at here is the results within 16 weeks, which is just four months having started the drug. On the left-hand side, you're actually looking at volume. So we looked at the whole tumor volume and how that changes, and you can see many of these patients, the tumor starts shrinking as a whole volume itself. And the resist response rate is on the right-hand side. So this is very, very early uh, results. So as we know that these responses will continue to mature 
as patients remain on drug uh, over a uh, course of time. And this is a very interesting signal. As I mentioned before, even though these tumors may not be changing dimensionally, what we're seeing is that intra, within the tumor itself, intracellularly, there is a shift how these tumors are basically starting to die from a cellular tumor to a collagenous tumor. So to give an example, here's a tumor that looks nice and bright and cellular on an MRI T2 signal. And on treatment, even though the size remains more or less about the same, and one would classify this as a stable disease, the intracellular cellularity here is changing into a dark thing. And again, in subject two, you see the exact same thing, nice bright mass, which basically, uh, and this is, this is a treatment effect that we're seeing here. And this is uh, not exactly captured if you just look at resist itself. And here in the scan, you can see all of these patients are starting to have pretty dramatic changes in their uh, MRI T2 signal very early on within the first 16 weeks of being on drug. Um, and again, we're looking at volume as well as central resist. Uh, volume and resist uh, go hand in hand. And again, that's what we're, we're seeing here. So the study, again, basically at the end of it concluded that the best efficacy was with the daily dosing of AL-102 as part of this ring site study. So this is now, the phase three is now open. Uh, it's open globally, um, and patients are already enrolling into it. And the enrollment criteria is very similar, which is basically tumors, again, need to have progression at the time of entry uh, into the study. And then people get randomized into placebo versus drug and crossover at the time of radiographic progression.